and welcome to today's webinar. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to welcome everyone back after what's been a bit of a hiatus over the summer. We did a, a few episodes of the CAFC Presents webinar series over the summer, but not our weekly. Uh, we weren't able to maintain our weekly schedule just with vacations and everything else that goes on in the summer. So it's nice to be back into the swing of things. Um, our topic today, as you all know, is uh, or the title today is, Is Canada Failing Its Children and Young People? Reactions to the 2013 UNICEF Innocenti Report Card. And this is a bit of a, a, a different uh, webinar than what we typically do. Uh, as and, and the reason we're doing this is because uh, this topic uh, came to us uh, from a close friend and colleague that Elaine uh, Orbein, CAFC's president and CEO, is going to introduce in a bit. But we recognize that this uh, topic is not really uh, specific to uh, CAFC and its membership. So we are pleased to be uh, partnering with the Canadian Child and Youth uh, Health Coalition, which CAFC is one of the founding members of that organization. And we're going to be hearing from uh, some of our colleagues from the coalition to learn a little bit more about what, what the coalition is and why this why they felt this was an important topic. And you'll also notice that uh, this is not on our usual Wednesday webinar slot. And in fact, we've as, as part of our partnership with the coalition on this topic, we are doing it on, on at their usual slot when they do what they refer to as their hot topics. Um, so, uh, t but, t but the format, for those of you who have been on uh, CAFC's webinars in the past, uh, will be the same. Um, uh, and uh, which uh, is to say that we do have an hour and a half scheduled. We try to get the presentation in, in the first hour and the last half hour, uh, and sometimes throughout the session, we do have take questions from the audience. And as you all know, uh, in order to ask a question, all you have to do is type your questions into the question box that you'll see in the control panel on your screen. And I always encourage you to type the questions in as you think of them. Uh, that way you, uh, you don't forget them if you come up with a good question. And it also helps us uh, see at what point during the uh, session uh, the questions come in so we can it will help us understand uh, uh, who, who the questions may be best directed to on the panel. Um, so uh, with that being said, I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, basically just sit back and listen for the next little while as we have a number of uh, people helping me host this. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to uh, hand the virtual podium over to, as I mentioned, CAFC's president and CEO, uh, Elaine Orbein. Thanks, Doug, and good morning. Uh, and uh, I guess in, in uh, the eastern part of Canada, good afternoon. And in England, good afternoon to all of our participants. And uh, my appreciation to everyone for joining us this morning. This morning, as Doug mentioned, is a very special uh, webinar that is really being uh, facilitated by our Canadian Child and Youth Health Coalition. And two very special guests and presenters. And that's where I'd really like to begin. Uh, Sorrell Ainsley Grain, and we must, we must um, uh, turn to Al uh, this morning in, in that uh, more informal way, uh, is a very special friend indeed. Uh, Al um, Ainsley Grain trained as a children's physician and was uh, James Spence professor, professor of Child Health in Newcastle uh, upon Tyne, and then uh, Newfield Professor and Director of Clinical Research at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children and the Institute of Child Health in London. Uh, Al was the first National Clinical Director for Children in Government and the first independent statutory children's commissioner for England from 2005 to 2010. Um, we have brought um, Al's bio to you on our Knowledge Exchange Network uh, for you to, uh, to read a little bit later at your convenience. Um, I will mention as well that um, I met Al uh, when he uh, was CAFC's uh, 2006 annual conference keynote speaker in uh, Vancouver that year. And I have certainly been privileged to establish a uh, very important and valued friendship uh, with you, Al. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's my pleasure to also introduce um, a, a new friend and colleague, and that is Lisa Wolf. Lisa is the Director of Policy and Education at UNICEF Canada. Lisa has worked in the organization for more than a decade, directing the domestic education and policy programs, which advance the rights of Canada's children to develop to their fullest potential, 
consistent with international human rights standards. We are absolutely delighted to welcome Lisa as our as our uh, speaker this morning, and in fact, uh, we'll be turning uh, to Lisa in just a couple of moments to lead off the presentation. I'd also like to just take one more moment to recognize the leadership of the Canadian Child and Youth Health Coalition uh, through our um, through a few of the members of our executive who are on the line with us today. And um, they are a wonderful colleague and uh, friend from uh, London. Dr. Sarah Jones is uh, the coalition's co-chair uh, and is a pediatric surgeon at London Health Sciences Centre, Children's Hospital of Western Ontario, and a former uh, ch chair and chief of the Department of Pediatrics at Queen's University. In, uh, in Kingston. It is also my privilege to introduce another very close colleague and friend, Dr. Ian Mannion. Uh, Ian is the Executive Director of the Ontario Center of Excellence for Children and Youth, as well as the Coalition's uh, long-standing executive uh, member. And um, finally, um, Dr. Bruno Piedbeuf, uh, Bruno is the former chair and chief of the Department of Pediatrics at Laval University and is currently the associate dean of research at the Université de Laval uh, in, uh, in Quebec City. Um, our panelists will, will join in our uh, interactive uh, question and answer period uh, throughout, the, throughout the call. Um, We'd like to start today's uh, webinar by turning to you, to our participants from across Canada and well beyond our Canadian borders, um, to, uh, to respond to a poll question that uh, Doug is going to put up on, on um, the screen for us. And uh, the question we would like you to respond to, is Canada failing its children and youth? This is going to be a key part and perhaps the cross-cutting theme of today's discussion. And we'd really appreciate if everyone could take a moment to answer that question electronically on, on your uh, screens before you. So again, is Canada failing its children and youth? And Doug will ask you to instruct everyone in terms of how to respond. Yeah, so as you can see, the question is up on the screen right now, and I can see that most of you have already started clicking on the screen to answer. So that's how you make your response. Just go up to the screen and uh, and click on your selection, and it will be recorded. And in just a second, we'll flip around uh, the answers and or the responses and see what uh, what the audience uh, thinks on this topic. At least at the beginning of the session. I'm not sure if opinions will change as we go along, but. Uh, all right, just a couple more seconds before we close this off. I think most of the responses are in. Close that off, and we can see that uh, the overwhelming opinion, 85% have said yes, that Canada is failing its children and youth. All right. Thank you, Doug, and thank you to everyone who joined in so quickly um, to participate uh, in, in today's webinar, and, uh, and really that's what this is all about. It's an opportunity for us to interact. And, uh, and that really sets the tone for what I know is going to be a very important and exciting uh, 90 minutes ahead. Without any further ado, uh, it is truly my privilege to hand the podium over to Dr. Sarah Jones. Um, and Sarah is going to um, just provide a little bit of uh, background on the Canadian Child and Youth Health Coalition and then uh, turn to Lisa to begin the presentation. Sarah. Thank you very much, uh, Lane, and uh, um, on behalf of the, the CCYHC, um, I welcome everybody uh, to the webinar, and I understand that uh, we have many listeners from uh, different areas, uh, um, and I think that's uh, very, very exciting, um, and, and clearly we all have one goal, um, and uh, that is to, to make things better. So you were just asked the question, is Canada failing our children? And uh, we know that that question was generated from the 2013 UNICEF uh, Innocenti Report Card. Um, we didn't do so well in that. And uh, I, I quote from UNICEF, and I'm sure that Lisa will do the same, uh, a nation stuck in the middle. 
when I first heard that uh, sort of statement, I thought, well, that really can't be true. Um, and clearly, from from your answers to the question, that uh, you understand that. Um, and I was thinking, well, maybe it's in areas that we're not capturing data well. Um, but uh, that's also not the case. Um, so today, the coalition presents you with information that will hopefully engage you um, to think about why we're in the middle and how unacceptable that is. Uh, the coalition is made up of uh, 11 member organizations, and I'm not going to quote them all. They're, they're in front of you on your screen. I, I think you can access them. Um, but uh, we're made up of such as members of CAFC. Uh, most of you around the table will be familiar with them. Canadian Pediatric Society, um, the Pediatric uh, Surgical Chairs of Canada, and the National Infant, Child, and Youth Mental Health Consortium. These are just to name a few. But I think they give an example of the breadth of uh, involvement within the coalition um, and how uh, substantial it is and how far-reaching it is. Um, it covers uh, many, many different areas. Um, the collective mandate of the coalition is to strengthen advocacy to advance the health and health care of Canada's children and youth. Um, and uh, we're often seen to focus primarily on the health of children, but I think today is a very, very nice example of how we are uh, really looking to fulfill our final mandate of the coalition, which is to engage a broad range of constituents and stakeholders across, across the continuum of uh, child and youth health and well-being. Um, and, and that's what uh, we're certainly uh, going to hear about today. Um, the uh, webinar today is sort of uh, uh, mushroomed from something that we have each month within our uh, steering committee, um, which is what we call a hot topic. And a hot topic uh, talks about uh, issues within uh, Canada's child and youth healthcare that we feel that we can become involved in, that uh, we can advocate for. Um, and uh, these have really helped to drive the coalition over the past year. So I think that gives you a little background on the coalition. It gives you a little background on uh, where the webinar is going today. And uh, I hope that it uh, will engage you um, as it has engaged us. Um, and so I think without further ado, I'd like to get to the meat and potatoes of the webinar and turn over this uh, electronic podium to Lisa from UNICEF. So the table is yours, Lisa. Thank you very much, Sarah, and hello, everyone. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to explore UNICEF's latest report card with you today. This is our 11th report card focusing on children in industrialized countries, and it was released in April. Um, just a quick note about UNICEF's report cards. Um, as you know, UNICEF is a global organization, and we work in virtually every country. We get our mandate from the member states of the UN, uh, but because we're a specialized fund, we rely entirely on voluntary contributions. And I've sometimes mused on why the Children's Fund should be you know, one to, to rely only on voluntary contributions. Um, I've come to realize that there's some advantages in that. It makes us work harder for attention, and certainly um, the, the state of children is, is one that um, depends on attention to, to shift will and resources. Um, you might know UNICEF better for our work in low and middle income countries, and that is where we uh, transfer resources, where we work with governments to deliver programs and services and build capacity. Um, we do that through cooperation agreements with governments, and no industrialized country government has asked UNICEF to do that. So in, in industrialized countries, we, um, we focus on policy advocacy. And the premise is that rich countries should have the resources and capacity to do what they need to do for their children. Uh, what's often missing is the political will to do that, and that's where advocacy comes in. And our international office of research serves uh, some of our knowledge and evidence needs for our work worldwide. It produces these report cards. And it's based in Florence, in Italy, in offices donated by the Italian government. And we occupy what was actually a medieval orphanage uh, built in 1491, which is appropriate enough for our work. We have a small staff of lead researchers there, and we work with many external um, experts from around the world to develop our research, including our report cards. And I think being in a historic institution like that reminds us that um, 
you know, societies have taken care of children in different ways, dating back centuries, but it's, um, you know, constant striving to do, to do better for children. And uh, the state of our kids today um, demands no less of us. So um, report card 11 uh, paints a very broad, a selective but broad picture of child well-being, and it contains quite a lot of information. We cover 26 indicators across 29 nations. So I'm going to do my best to extract what the report card tells us about Canada's children and look at how this stacks up against other industrialized countries and um, you know, whether or not the well-being of Canada's children has improved. Um, the report doesn't tell us why these things are or what we should do about them. I think this is cha a challenge for all of us and I'm very glad that Sir Al is here to bring us his uh, global and cross-national perspectives about that. So the centerpiece of Report Card 11 is a league table of child well-being. And the league table compares the 29 industrialized countries on an index of child well-being. So we take the 26 indicators and we create a composite index that averages them. And we rank countries according to that. And the, the um, indicators in the report card that we use to the 26 different indicators to measure child well-being really fall into five different dimensions of well-being. We have material well-being, which includes poverty. We have health and safety, education, behaviors and risks, and housing and the environment. And the league table shows that some countries are achieving much higher child well-being than others, even in some circumstances, other countries that have similar or larger economies. So there's no strong relationship between the health of an economy and the health of children. Uh, the Netherlands is the clear leader in child well-being in our report. It's the only country that ranked in the top five um, in all five dimensions of well-being. And you can see that Romania is, um, came in last place, which may not be a surprise given its um, challenges as, um, as a, a struggling sort of middle-income country that's become uh, um, an industrialized country not too long ago. Now the story of Canada in Report Card 11 is um, what we call a, a country stuck in the middle. And, and this is happening in many ways. Um, we find that Canadian children rank 17th of the 29 countries we measure, which is a middle position, um, but it's also in the middle because it hasn't improved since we last measured it a decade ago. So Canada's ranking hasn't budged. We're, we're stuck in the middle. And when factoring the size and health of our economy among the 29 nations measured, some of whom have been hit much harder by the, um, the financial recession, um, you know, we suggest that the overall well-being of Canadian children could be better. Doug, I don't know if you want to show your next poll question at this point. It might be a good time to do that. The, the question that we wanted to ask was, where do you think uh, Canada ranks among industrialized countries in our children's level of well-being? Do we rank at the top, the middle, or the bottom? We may have uh, already let the cat out of the bag on that one. Yeah, we, I think we're just, just uh, <laughs> <laughs> taking yeah. stock of <laughs> who's following along. Yeah, so it looks like... Uh, I hope we have 100% yeah, going the middle. Not okay. quite. So I was going to say, uh, okay. most people are listening. At 89% uh, caught the middle, uh, but a few people uh, select the top and the bottom, but certainly the vast majority... Uh, uh, said that they, were, they felt we were stuck in the middle. Uh, and the next poll question was, um, how do you think Canada's level of child well-being has changed in contrast to 10 years ago? Has it improved over the last 10 years? Has it declined over the last 10 years? Or has it stayed the same? And as I, I did forget to mention one thing at the top of the webinar, uh, and I'm surprised it hasn't been asked yet, but uh, yes, we will make the presentation available after the uh, after the session. We make the uh, the PowerPoint slides that are being used right now will be available as a PDF, and the full recording, the audio visual recording, will also be made available on the Knowledge Exchange Network following this. So I usually remember to say that at the beginning, but I didn't. 
All okay, right, so, so are we all we're all clear that um, Canada is in the middle among the 29 nations, and yes, this so, uh, has not changed in a decade. Yes, yeah, so 84 percent right. have agreed that uh, it has stayed the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that tells us a little bit about how Canada is doing. Um, let's look uh, more closely at um, at where we're doing well, where we're middling, and where we are falling far behind. So in the report card, we post league tables for each of the five dimensions of well-being, um, as well as the overall composite index. So in um, behaviors and risk, for example, we have a ranking um, compared to other the, the 29 other countries. The report, if you have a chance to look at it, also uh, presents league tables for every indicator that we measure in those dimensions. So there are, you know, 26 different league tables for the indicators, as well as the, the sort of overall uh, composite indices. And I think what's important to note about, about the league tables is that they record the standards that are achieved by the highest performing nations. Who's at the top? How far are they, um, you know, how far have they gone, for example, in, in immunizing their children, in lowering the infant mortality rate? And that should contribute to debate in Canada about how such standards can be achieved. Because international comparison really reveals what's achievable in practice. So we might have a vision or a broad goal that no teenager uses cannabis, for example. Um, in Canada, 28% do. In Norway, 5% do. So if our big vision is to get that rate down to zero, Norway has gotten it down to as low as 5%. At least that could be an interim goal for us um, in Canada because it's achievable. And another point about the indicators uh, in this report card is that they were chosen uh, because they're all readily and directly influenced by policy choices. They're all policy susceptible. And you can see from the infograph on this slide that Canada is at or below average in four of the five dimensions. We are particularly low in uh, health and safety at a ranking of 27 of 29 countries. That might come as a surprise to you. Um, we're above average only in housing and the environment. In some aspects of child well-being, in these particular indicators I'm showing now, uh, Canada shines. We're at the top. We're among the top uh, of the 29 uh, countries that we measure. We lag at the bottom in others, which we'll get to in a moment, but that is the pattern in many other countries. You know, some countries do well in some things and not as well in others. Um, areas where Canada's children are doing better than their peers uh, include a low smoking rate, where we rank third of 29 nations, high achievement of children in math, reading, and science literacy, where we uh, achieved second of 29. In the middle of the pack, uh, we have uh, the indicators showing on this screen. Um, I just want to point out one in particular here, um, low birth weight rate, where we rank 10, um, 10 out of 29. And this is important uh, because it's uh, a sentinel of broader child well-being. And among industrialized countries, variations in the low birth weight rate appear to be quite small, but the differences are really significant given the influence of low birth weight um, as a determinant of children's chances of survival and healthy growth and its association with a, a broad range of conditions in childhood and beyond. And it's, it's a policy challenge because, as you know, the causes are somewhat divergent. Um, they can include poor prenatal health linked to broader socioeconomic determinants, but also pregnancy at older ages is not in, in sometimes more affluent situations. So, you know, these are not necessarily um, easy um, to, to address through policy, um, but um, probably where we want to focus most of our attention is where Canada is at the bottom. We're in the bottom third among um, comparable nations. And you can see the indicators here. There are a number of them where we are, uh, you know, at a 21st out of 29 position or lower. And uh, just before I, I look at a couple of these with you, I want to recognize that um, the majority of Canada's children are faring well in any given indicator. So even where we're further behind most other countries, in some cases it's not a great distance. 
Um, most children are immunized, 84% according to our statistics. Most don't smoke. Most have healthy weights. But uh, in contrast to comparable countries, you know, we would argue that we have too many children who are left out of public health and protection efforts who are not benefiting from their years of compulsory education by going on in sufficient numbers to further education, training, and employment. And I'll just uh, pick apart a few of the indicators here, again, given our concerns that, that we're at the bottom in these areas. Um, in child poverty, I think it's notable that as many as half the countries in the league table, half of those 29 countries have brought child poverty below 10%. At Canada, it's still 14%, um, and that hasn't changed much um, over time, in the last decade at least. And this uh, rate of 14% is more than double the rate of the top four countries. So we think it's an area that we can do better. Um, in infant mortality, only the Eastern European nations, like Romania uh, and the United States, post a higher infant mortality rate than Canada. Everyone else has managed to lower it. And, and I'm aware that there seems to be an unresolved debate um, in Canada about how much of that rate can be attributed to how we actually measure infant mortality, um, that we, we count the deaths of extremely premature or low birth weight babies, who are kept alive by neonatal care and who in other countries might not be classified as live birth. Um, and, and there could be a proportion uh, you know, of mo older mothers having high risk pregnancies that, that impact on that rate. Um, and you know, our challenge is, is um, to the community to let's, let's get clearer on how much is a definitional issue and recognize that the infant mortality rate varies significantly across Canada's provinces and territories. And it's known to be much higher than the national average in, in vulnerable groups like Indigenous children. So we think that shows that Canada has room to make improvements. And I want to mention immunization coverage. Uh, and we measured the, um, the vaccination rate for measles, polio, and DPT3. And Canada's rank is you know, very low, at, at 84% of children immunized. Um, we're at 28 of 29 nations. And it's... Um, it's a conundrum that three of the richest countries in the world, Canada, Denmark, and Austria, are the only ones where the immunization rate is lower than 90%. And the immunization rate is now higher in Eritrea and in many other developing countries where UNICEF works than it is in Canada. And we feel that running a first-class immunization program means a commitment to make sure that the public is well-informed and children are not put at risk by going without basic immunization. Um, just a couple of other notes on, on these statistics. Um, the only indicator, and, and you've probably noticed it, is, uh, where Canada ranks dead last is in the rate of young people reporting that, that they had tried cannabis in the last 12 months. And I think it's noteworthy that given the current debate about legalizing cannabis use in Canada, um, we find that countries like Finland, Germany, Norway, Sweden have cannabis use rates under 10%, and again, Canada's is 28%. Um, there is no obvious correlation between the um, adolescent use rate and whether or not cannabis use is legalized in any given country. There's not an obvious correlation. Um, so it really begs the question what more you know, could be done through public health efforts to lower this rate. Um, it, it has come down from 40% when we last measured it a decade ago um, in Canada. Um, but in one year that we, uh, we looked at, uh, 2006, more than 4,700 kids in Canada were charged with a cannabis offense and brought into the criminal justice system. And we all know that, um, you know, that, that contributes to uh, additional problems for kids. It doesn't solve um, cannabis use. And so, we have our work, I think, to do in this area as well. So I'm just moving on to um, a second area in the report uh, that I think sounds a few alarm bells, and it's what children say about their own well-being. Uh, Canada ranked, as I mentioned, 17 out of 29 countries when we looked at the, um, the objective indicators of well-being. But we drop by seven places to 24th of 29 when we look at children's views, what they think of their own well-being. And we have a league table of children's satisfaction that shows that only the Eastern European nations rank lower in this area than Canada. And again, it's a bit of a, you know, a, a mixed um, 
set of news here. The good news is that close to 84% of Canada's children report a fairly high level of life satisfaction. Um, but when we look at children's assessment of the quality of their close relationships, uh, we're seeing that the average of measures of relationships with classmates, mothers and fathers is really low. 25 out of 28 industrialized countries is where Canada falls when kids tell us about how um, easy it is to talk to their mothers or their fathers, um, how they find their classmates in terms of being kind or helpful. Uh, Canada, France and the US are the only countries ranked in the bottom for all three types of relationships. And then finally, the, uh, the third and, and last main area of the report looks back a decade at um, how, we, how our children's well-being has, has changed. And Canada, like most countries, has made progress in most of the indicators, which is good news and maybe not news to you, but the rates of you know, teenage births, smoking, alcohol use, all have shown considerable improvement over the past decade. Some things are more stagnant, like the rate of bullying and fighting. Uh, but the report card also captures those areas where we've actually worsened, um, the indicators that have declined over the last decade. And those are shown here uh, in terms of those that we measured. So we see that um, low birth weight has actually worsened. Immunization, uh, no country has declined in its immunization rate more than Canada. We fell by nine percentage points over the last decade. And, sorry, I'm going to stay here for a moment. Um, should mention that children's life satisfaction, um, which is, again, currently low, uh, has fallen uh, over the past decade. Um, Canada, Austria, and Greece showed the greatest decline in this measure. And about half of the countries, half of the 29 countries, showed improvements. So it's possible to improve. This is a trend that we need to reverse. And overall, again, the middle rank among comparable countries hasn't changed in 10 years. The Nordic countries have stayed in the top positions. Some countries have worsened, um, but others have advanced, including the UK, which Sir Al um, is going to tell us more about. So again, it's possible to do better and to move ahead. And before uh, concluding, I, um, I want to acknowledge that there's some missing pieces in this report card. Um, obviously, you know, with 26 indicators, which on the face of it feels like a lot to digest, we're missing out a lot, you know, a, a bigger picture of how kids are doing. We don't cover um, indicators of um, mental health or child maltreatment or children in detention. Um, our report card really used internationally comparative data. We focused on a few of the basic fundamentals that we should be getting right at this point in a rich country and those that are really directly influenced by policy. So that meant some choices. Um, and we know that you know, international comparisons depend on national averages. They aren't um, really useful in looking more deeply inside a country at um, inequities. We have trouble ourselves with our own data sets in Canada about revealing you know, how, how different um, vulnerable groups are doing. And, and so that is um, you know, a missing piece in this picture. And then finally, I, you know, really all of this begs the question, you know, so what? What should we do about um, these things, and these trends? And, um, you know, there are some obvious maybe sectoral responses that, that would seem indicated, like making child health a higher priority, increasing immunization, addressing risky behaviors, um, improving the path from education to work, that paradox that our kids do well academically um, in, in the compulsory years of education, but what's happening to the high rate that aren't moving on to further education and training and employment? Uh, they're not translating that, you know, that good education system in, in, into those things. Um, and increasing um, the healthy relationships that children have with their peers and parents. Those are some maybe sectoral responses to think about. But we suggest that there's some structural or you know, fundamental governance issues that have contributed to Canada's poor performance and that could support better performance. And you know, briefly, there are three things that we think Canada could do uh, without too much difficulty that would help. Um, first, we could make children a priority in budget allocations and give them the first call that they deserve on our nation's resources. 
the countries at the top of the league table invest more in child benefits and services. And we think that at minimum, Canada's governments should publish an annex to their budgets when they come down that show how much is being spent on children in income benefits and services. And that way we can understand whether kids are receiving a fair share of the nation's resources. And are they growing? Are they declining? Are they geared to the needs that we're seeing? And secondly, we think that um, Canada should report regularly on the state of its children. If we can do it as UNICEF in this rudimentary way, you know, what could we do drawing on Canada's wealth of information about kids to create an annual state of the children report that measures the broad conditions of childhood that are influenced by governments? And finally, uh, we think that um, children should be more visible to decision makers um, through child rights impact assessments that any level of government can apply when they're proposing a bill or a policy and having a national children's commissioner to help make kids and their needs more visible. So I guess the question is, what do you think? And um, that brings me to the end of um, my you know, introduction to, to what our data are, are telling us. And Doug, I'm wondering if there's any comments or questions at this point. All right, thank you, Lisa. Uh, there haven't been any questions come in quite yet, but uh, again, that's my chance to remind the audience uh, to type in your questions as you think of them, and we'll be happy to bring them forward to the, uh, to the presenters. Uh, Okay, so I thought somebody here had a comment, but uh, so we're now just going to go on to the second portion of the presentation and we're going to uh, hand the virtual podium over to Sir Al Ainsley Green. Over to you, Al. Okay, Doug. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, just while I uh, twiddle with electronics to get my uh, slides up on the screen, look, it's a fantastic delight for me to be here uh, this afternoon. It's a surreal delight. I'm sitting in my office in my home, which was built in 1594, a glorious early autumn day, looking out over the water meadows to the spire of Salisbury Cathedral. And uh, you guys are all over Canada, so as I say, it's a surreal experience for me uh, to be talking to you. But it's one that I'm really enjoying, and I thought Lisa's presentation set the scene perfectly, and I just want to put my marker down to say how much I appreciate and value uh, the work of UNICEF worldwide, uh, and uh, particularly in Canada and in the UK. So here's my title slide, Childhood and Child Health Today, Some Challenging Perspectives from England. And that was the title of the speech I was invited to give in Edmonton in May at the um, uh, Institute of Health Economics Innovations Forum. And uh, I'll tell you more about that and the research I did to inform my speech. But I just mentioned to you, I'm now in my extraordinary fourth career. Um, having stood down as Children's Commissioner, I have my independent international consultancy. And so I do have the privilege to be working with organizations, people, governments from Australia, through Spain, Norway, the EU, and also in Canada. So I think I can bring to the table today some international perspectives from my own personal personal experience of visiting many countries over the last few months. Uh, and the view that we have here in England, which you may remember as a small, primitive and impoverished island off the coast of mainland Europe, for many of us here, we see Canada to be the promised land. It's one of the most desirable countries to live in, according to international polls. It's a land of opportunity, wealth, and fabulous resources. And as David Cameron has said, the 21st century is Canada's. And that's uh, hooked up to my incurable Canada filia. Uh, this goes back well over 30, if not 40 years. I've made many visits to Canada, lots of friends and colleagues. And there are four things I would emphasize immediately that I respect. The first is your Roots of Empathy program. Many of you may know what it is. Uh, my dipstick questions in Canada shows that many people don't know what it is. It is the most fantastic parenting program for three to 11 year olds set up by Mary Gordon and we are trying to implement it in the UK. I know it's running in Japan and Australia and other countries of the world. So Roots of Empathy comes from Canada. The second is your Rights Respecting Schools program which started in Cape Breton Island. And this is a program to make the rights of children real in schools. And UNICEF UK is leading a program in this country where many schools have signed up to be benchmarked against their performance on children's rights. 
the Human Early Learning Partnership Program from Vancouver is something which is simply mind-blowing and staggering. I did so at Mayor Clyde Hertzman, and it's such a pity he has recently died. But I've been to Vancouver many times to see the evolution of the Early Learning Partnership Program. It is something you guys can be really, really proud of. And then, of course, you've got outstanding children's hospitals and research centers. I think I've visited almost all your children's hospitals across uh, Canada, and I'm always in awe at the amount of money you have, the resources you have, and the can-do spirit. I highlight two, uh, two specific aspects to draw to attention. The fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. I've tried as a lone voice in the wilderness here in the UK to raise the importance of this. Uh, this month in Edmonton, as you know, Egon Johnson is running the first major international symposium uh, and conference on FASD. And this just shows you how you can identify uses and take them forward. And last year, I was invited to give a keynote at the NeuroDevNet conference in Toronto. Dan Goldovitz invited me to attend, and I was again blown away by the sheer power of your potential collaboration across all the research centers, identifying uh, uh, important advances and understanding neurodevelopmental uh, conditions. As I said, in May, I was invited to the IHE in Edmonton, and the full proceedings are available on the IHE website. Uh, their forum was televised, some fantastic presentations from policymakers and from others uh, in Alberta. And then I was also invited to take part in the, uh, in the Alberta Lieutenant Governor's Circle on Mental Health, where I highlighted the importance of bereavement in childhood and uncovered uh, a huge unmet need of support services for bereaved children. So that's just a quick whiff of my credibility uh, to speak internationally and from my insights into Canada. So the exam question I logged to the audience uh, in May in um, uh, Alberta was, is Canada failing its children? And this was provoked by this banner headline in your Metro newspaper. And I have to tell you, please do not see me to be Moses coming from the mountaintop telling you guys what to do. Because as I say on this slide, the UK certainly is still uh, failing its children as I will explain in just a moment. So that's the exam question, is Canada failing its children? The evidence, I highlight two specific reports. The first um, that Lisa has spoken about, which is the UNICEF um, report on child well-being, but I also want to draw to your attention uh, the report from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, their concluding observations published in October uh, of, uh, of last year. And in my dipstick questions in Canada, I ask people, how many of you know about the UNICEF report? The answer is a minority. How many of you know about the UN committees concluding observations? Again, a minority of people have read those reports. In my view, these are very, very important levers for political traction. So the point about the UNICEF report is that it is a continuing process. And we had the report in 2007, and Lisa's told you about the 2013 report. But I see their importance to be them as holistic uh, reports looking at health, education, social care, and above all, self-report. Now, in 2007, this is the league table here. Uh, Lisa's told you about the top division with the Netherlands being at the top, but let me tell you, when I go to uh, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, I go to a different planet in terms of society's views of children and the commitment from politicians to make sure they are getting a good deal. In 2007, the UK right at the bottom, bottom of the list, there's Canada, uh, I think 16th at that time, UK right at the bottom. Now, this report came as a bombshell. And I can tell you it was exploited fully by the commissioners for England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. We mounted a ferocious media program targeting politicians, asking the question, why is this the case? And it coincided uh, with the middle of the Blair and Brown Labour Administration's initiative to put children at the heart of government. And I pay real credit uh, to our Labour Administration for doing that. I don't have time to go into the detail, uh, but our government at that time had a national plan called Every Child Matters. This is the frontispiece of the, uh, the plan, and through consultation and dialogue, they identified five outcomes they thought government should be responsible for, making sure children are healthy, staying safe, 
enjoying and achieving, making a positive contribution and achieving economic well-being. Now we had a Secretary of State for children, schools and families and the DCSF was charged with making sure every Department of State was held to account for every aspect of work that it did that related to children. They were given budgets uh, from the Treasury to make sure this happened and they were held to account. This also uh, uh, coincided with local uh, legislation to make sure there was a director of children's services in each locality to make sure health, education, social care, the voluntary sector were being coordinated. This really was, in my view, the most important policy development uh, that we had in the UK. And I have no doubt it was, at least in part, a great part, in instrumental in improving our position from 26 uh, from the bottom to the middle here, one step above you uh, in Canada. So I do believe that uh, public focus, lobbying, media pressure, advocacy in the light of these sorts of reports can be hugely important politically in getting political traction. So as I prepared for my speech in Edmonton, I did three months of research, uh, trawling the internet for every bit of data I could find on Canada, including the ones I'm talking about. I telephoned lots of my colleagues across York, a wonderful country, for their views, and I was struck by how little outrage there was. Here is the mismatch between you being one of the richest and best and most desirable countries to live in, yet your performance for the outcomes for kids really was mismatched against your potential. And here are just a couple of pages. The first is from the Metro, the second one from HuffPost with a plea to stop ignoring our children's well-being. And so my question is, why is there so little outrage in Canada over the fact that you are performing uh, way below, in my view, your potential against your wealth and your, your opportunities? And I want to uh, support uh, what Lisa said with a further dimension into the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child with the concluding observations published in October uh, of last year. Uh, so my question to you is how many of you know and use the UNCR? Well, we've tried very hard to make it real in our country. Uh, but I draw to your attention the key conclusions for Canada from 2012. There are 22 pages, 99 recommendations and some clauses which include some really important issues. A national strategy for children. Do you have it? Data collection. Lisa's already talked about that. National provincial child specific budgets. You don't seem to have those. The um, difficulties of establishing federal children's commissioner or ombudsman uh, you're well aware of. Disparities in access, the best interests of the child, respect for the views of the child, violence against children, children with disabilities, mental health, child poverty, asylum-seeking refugee children and youth justice. There are real issues that the International uh, Scrutiny Panel, uh, i.e. the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, have identified to be issues for Canada to be confronting. Now, just to tell you about the process that we went through in 2008, uh, when uh, the UK government was held to account, and you recall this happens every five years, it starts by evidence being submitted to the UN Committee in Geneva. And on the left-hand side, you see a very important document produced by the Kids of England, uh, the Children's Rights Alliance, who submitted their views on their lives, uh, very hard-hitting, very authoritative, and hugely uh, responsible document from the kids. And they were taken to uh, Geneva alongside us. And on the right-hand side, you can see the pre-sessional interrogation in 2008. Here is La Grande Salle uh, in the Geneva headquarters of the UN, the famous room where the League of Nations first started. Here are us. Uh, there's me with the bald head halfway down. Here are kids that came with us, NGOs. And around the room, you can't see them in the photograph, there are the members of the UN committee. And for two hours they threw questions at us. We were given an hour uh, to think about them and then the rest of the uh, day was spent answering the questions in between which the committee had a separate private meeting uh, with the children. And at the end of the day the committee told us uh, the input they most valued was the input from the kids and the input from the children's commissioners because they believed what we were saying and not so much the spin, perhaps, coming from a uh, government. And then in October, the government was held to account. And the seriousness of it is reflected in the fact that 30 members 
uh, of the administration went to Geneva. We went along to see what was uh, being said. And believe me, uh, the government really was held to account uh, by the UN committee. Now, does it do any good? Well, first of all, here are uh, the uh, 112 recommendations that came from the four children's commissioners. 112 recommendations uh, exposing deep concern over the ongoing failure to give children and young people full protection of civil rights, etc., under the UNCRC. Now, when we published this, again, we had a huge media blitz. It appeared on all the major news channels. Uh, we were filmed um, uh, with a document. We had opportunity to talk about why we were concerned about the uh, state of children's rights in the UK. Did it make any difference? Well, the first tangible evidence was on the uh, morning they were grilled by the committee. The very first declaration from our delegation was that they were ending the reservation uh, applied to asylum seekers for the UNCRC, uh, something people have been fighting for for the best part of 15 or more years because they were under open scrutiny internationally. That was followed by a major event run by the government in November 2009 to celebrate 20 years of the UNCRC. There was a Four Nations Ministerial Commitment, and here are the ministers from uh, England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, agreeing to have a UK-wide policy on making children's rights real, particularly the importance of children and young people's participation. So how do we make the UNCRC real? Well, I've no doubt from my experience of the tenure of being the first Children's Commissioner of England, this is a very, very important post. Uh, it was created by Parliament with independent and statutory powers to make sure the views, interests and needs of children and young people are taken seriously. I could consider or any, anything that affects them. I was obliged to publish reports, including an annual report to Parliament. I could demand information. I had to have regard to the UNCRC and to communicate with kids, but I was not an ombudsman uh, for individual children. That would have been an impossible task with 11.4 million children in England alone. But here is the single most important power I was given, the power to enter premises anywhere a child was being cared for apart from its home. Prisons, refugee centers, secure hospitals, schools, you name it, I could knock on the door and say I wanted to come in to talk to kids and by doing so we expose serious injustices and poor practice in a number of domains especially mental health, refugee children and children in prison. So there is a question should Canada have equivalents at federal and provincial levels and I have to say I find that really quite extraordinary why there is so much resistance to creating a federal uh, children's commissioner uh, in uh, in uh, your federal uh, government but this is a job which is more than your provincial advocates the power of entry gives exceptional powers so finally making it real apart from the commissioner we have to listen to what kids say and here is my very first campaign as commissioner shout turn up the volume a national competition with prizes for kids to tell us what's on your mind and we try and do something about it this had the most extraordinary response from kids a campaign led and orchestrated, designed, monitored uh, by children and young people. And we got an amazing, uh, rich uh, menu of things they were concerned about we could then try to, ta to start tackling. So finally, in wrap-up, I have no doubt whatsoever that the difficulties facing children in your country and mine are politicians. And so we have to somehow get effective political influence. And I know from 10 years of ricocheting around Whitehall in my roles how seriously difficult this is, not least because children cannot vote and there is no voting power to make sure governments hold children's issues to be important. We have to build relationships and trust. There's a huge amount of quiet behind the scenes engagement that is necessary. And of course, government, to give it credit, is looking for constructive suggestions uh, to the problems it's facing. And there is no point just bleating. We have to come forward with constructive suggestions. But as a children's commission, I was walking a very difficult tightrope on the one hand, challenging government, on the other hand, trying to work with them to, prov to provide suggestions uh, that were constructive. And a practical point is when do our organizations raise a public challenge? Because the risk is that if you are too much of a nuisance, then the knee-jerk reaction from politicians is to ignore you and to marginalize you. So where is the line in the sand beyond which we will not go? 
And does the end always justify the means? For example, some of our important voluntary organizations have leapt into bed with government to do its job for it, and they have become entirely dependent on government largesse for their existence. Well, there are big questions about that. At the end of the day, those of us who speak up for kids must have personal integrity and above all courage. I was identified as public enemy number one uh, for the tenure of my post with a vicious, persistent, high-profile campaign against me by some of our tabloid media. So, we have to understand politics. And here is Jeremy Paxman's amazing book published by Penguin, uh, The Political Animal. And I commend it to you. We have to try to understand what makes politicians politicians. What drives them? A friend of mine said, these people must have been normal once. Well, we have to understand them. And I had a ringside view of that in my years in government. And I think organizations need to be astute by having an academic political bureau of people who understand politicians, who understand parliament. The scales fell from my eyes as a pediatrician going into government to learn for the first time how government worked, how bills were prepared, etc., and how to be effective in terms of lobbying. So it behoves us who want to see things different for kids to understand politicians and politics. So what do we need from government? Seven points, in my view. A political ideology that treats children as a vital priority and resource and as a citizen in their own right. And I've seen how that's done in Sweden, where, for example, uh, in the government, there's an office whose only function is to child-proof every aspect of emerging legislation and policy, even those that at first glance may not be relevant to children. Every aspect of government policy is child assessed. Then second, explicit commitment from the very top, especially for the most vulnerable. An intellectual framework for an overall policy, not bunkered between education, uh, home affairs, um, uh, health, etc. With a clear vision, objectives, and desired outcomes. With an integrated responsibility for all aspects of policy affecting children across government and of course with resources and a delivery framework. Now we had almost all of this under the Blair and the uh, Brown uh, administration. Uh, the greatest symptom, a symbol of this was a Secretary of State at cabinet level for children, schools and families. And I do think this a policy was hugely influential in improving the outcomes of so many of our kids. And it's led from the very top. Here is Blair and Brown. Our objectives are to make sure that every child of the next generation has the opportunity to flourish, regardless of where they are born, where they grow up, where they are educated. And I do believe that Blair and Brown personally agreed and supported and um, signed up uh, to this statement from their government. Does this happen from your provincial governments or from your federal governments? Who at the top is leading? And a salutary lesson for you from England. I've told you about my admiration and support for what Blair and Brown did. In 2010, we had a new election and a conservative liberal democratic coalition government came to power. We no longer have that explicit commitment from the top. In fact, there's been a systematic unpicking of progress uh, made between 97 and 2009. We no longer have that powerful cabinet level voice of the Secretary of State for Children, Schools and Families, but one for education only, who was zealously focused on highly competitive education systems in the UK. There is no overall strategy, there is no intellectual construct. So. I alert you to the ephemeral nature of the party political cycle and we have to somehow embed our views and above all our processes so they are Im immutable and can't be changed by politicians, which raises my next point. We need effective political advocacy from the sector. And I believe there is a science to this that is just as important as effective and first-rate research. And I've written about this, uh, and I'm trying to uh, orchestrate in the UK some university departments that might be interested in de developing an academic focus uh, for effective political advocacy for children, because we are amateurs at this in the pediatric healthcare sector, in my view. You have two things going for you. Here is the first, the amazing health resource. Uh, this is a printout I got before I went to Edmonton, uh, which looks at the social vulnerability maps uh, for the city of Edmonton. You have the most amazing data in the world. 
about the outcomes for your children by locality level. And I've seen how a school can press a button and get a list of the nurturative assets in this locality for children. Look guys, you have something which is quite extraordinary and quite um, wonderful in my view. Is it being used enough in your thinking at a local level? And then, of course, I've talked about NeuroDevNet as just one example of your extraordinary power in bringing together research scientists uh, to look at very, very important issues. But my challenge to Dan Goldovitz and NeuroDevNet last year in Toronto and again recently is, what is NeuroDevNet doing about advocating for the services for the children uh, whose um, uh, neurodevelopmental problems which is so fantastically addressing in the scientific context. What is it doing to be an effective advocate uh, for children with these conditions? And this leads me to my penultimate slide, I think, which is what are the obstacles to change? It's us. What have we got to do to change our mindset uh, to speak for children? And here are my T's. Territorialism, tribalism, traditionalism, tunnel vision, timidity, terror, treasury, tiredness, exhaustion, and cynicism. And every one of those T words is uh, rampant across our country. Territorialism, oh, I'm in social care, you, I think, are education, and you must be in health. Tribalism, oh, I am a hospital doctor, you're a community doctor, I'm a school nurse, I'm a practice nurse. The tribalism is so destructive to get a coherent and a signed up um, view on what we need for our children. Traditionalism, oh, I've always done it this way. I'm perfectly happy doing it this way. Why should I bother to choose? Tunnel vision, I'm a super specialist. I have 60 case notes on my desk in an outpatient clinic with 60 patients waiting for me. It's not my business to speak for kids. It's somebody else's job. Diminity, I can't do this out. I've got far many other things to do. Terror, what if we get it wrong? In Treasury, we ain't got the money for it. And then finally, tiredness, exhaustion, and deep cynicism. Al, nothing's going to change. Thank God I'm retiring in six months' time. Now, I can tell you all of those sentiments I have encountered in my travels across uh, the UK, and I sense that many of them are present also in Canada. So my um, penultimate slide is uh, this famous quotation from Neil Postman, why should uh, governments be concerned about kids? Because they are the living messages to a time we will not see. And their future lies in our hands now, and we can't afford to fail them. So the final Exocet missile I throw out in my speeches across the UK and elsewhere is what are you going to do about it, guys? It is your business. I've written about the nurture of children should be everybody's business. And I think it's time that in our country, certainly, we got a much better cohesion in our services, a much better professionalism of effective advocacy, and above all, always getting government and politicians to realize the importance of children. So that's the end of my rant, guys. I hope there's been some re uh, resonance uh, and some relevance to you in Canada. And of course, I'd be delighted uh, to get your feedback to what I'm saying. Is what I'm saying relevant? Or should I catch the next plane back to Planet Zog? Okay, many thanks, Doug. All right. Thank you, Al. And certainly, uh, I think there's no question about the relevance of your message. I was there at the NeuroDevNet conference a year ago when I heard your message, and it's it's still relevant, and especially when you layer it on top of Lisa's presentation with the data, it's, re it's, even, it's even more uh, distressing, I think, uh, if nothing else. Um, we do have a question that's come in uh, from the audience, uh, and uh, while we're, I'll just uh, give this question to uh, to our presenters and to the panel, and I'll also put a uh, remind our panelists or get them thinking about uh, any comments that they might have. Once we uh, answer this question, we'll we'll get Ian and uh, and Sarah uh, to start thinking if they have any comments that they'd like to add to the dis this discussion. But first, we've got a question from Barbara, uh, and she's it's a comment and a question, and she's saying. Canada has, she's saying Canada already has provincial child advocates. And the concern is always setting up new organizations where significant dollars are spent on these organizations and not on frontline prevention and protection services. Her question is, how do we take the pot of money and properly allocate it when there are already so many organizations and, and administrations? Now, that may not be a question for necessarily our presenters. I would certainly open it up to any of our, our panelists if, uh, if they have a, any thoughts on that. Well, can I just make a, a comment? And um, uh, I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but your provincial child advocates 
and I've met many of them, I admire and respect what they do, they have a somewhat different function to a commissioner, as I saw my role. They are uh, primarily concerned about children who are in the care of the state, and I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they have the power of entry, and I don't think they have the remit to look across the piece that all the services are affecting children. Having said that, I do think that they are very important people, and there's an opportunity to brigade them. As we brigaded ourselves as the UK commissioners, for example, in talking to the UN uh, uh, committee, it's also possible perhaps to develop their role if that was thought to be important. I agree we shouldn't uh, reinvent the wheel, we shouldn't waste money unnecessarily. Uh, but um, uh, the amount of money that would be necessary to create a federal commissioner, and I think the leadership role of that sort of person uh, is very important, is peanuts against the total budget uh, for uh, Canada. So I think we have to have a reality check in terms of what we're talking about. If uh, I could just add to that, I think that the uh, having an opportunity to highlight the federal responsibility for these issues, rather than allowing uh, federal government to offload it onto provinces or onto already beleaguered uh, 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 child and family uh, uh, ombudsmen in different provinces, I think it speaks volumes when a nation stands up as a nation and say we have to uh, have this uh, uh, transcend our provinces. Uh, we reflect on every policy that we do, but also find a way to integrate the efforts across provinces. And this could be a bringing together uh, the child and family advocates from across the province and link it to uh, federal action and policy. Yeah, if I can just add, it's Lisa um, on the on the question. Um, you know, our, our provincial child and youth advocates have quite different mandates. They predated the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, whereas most of the European commissioners came after. So most of the European um, children's commissioners have a much broader mandate to look at all aspects of childhood and really raise children up on the political agenda. You know, in, in a big picture way. Um, many of our advocates, um, you know have done a fantastic job with fairly confined mandates to certain sectors and you know we would argue that um, their mandate should include all children and all of their rights all of the conditions of childhood and and be that you know unifying kind of elevating voice to cr help create the political conditions that will serve everyone working in you know in the health sector and other sectors to do it they need to, to do to have the resources they need to have the oversight uh, you know in terms of how kids are actually doing and mm -hmm. and a, a children's commissioner at the national level would fill a lot of holes there's a lot of federal policy that affects children that is not being attended to provincially like immigration you know the criminal uh, justice system and so on and um, I think that the the federal government estimated uh, a five million dollar cost or seven million I think it was anyway it would be about a dollar a child per year to have a, a national children's commissioner and as you say sir Al it's such a minuscule amount uh, of our of our budget Uh, we do have uh, we do have Dan uh, Goldwitz, uh, the scientific director of NeuroDevNet, in the office, and uh, Al. He has said he totally agrees with uh, what you've said, and uh, he totally agrees that you have to figure out what motivates politician politicians and ministers to get action. He goes on to say, but when what you are asking for might cost more money, when governments are trying to save money, how can you convince them to do uh, what you are advocating for? Uh, quite simply because children are our most precious resource and unless we invest in them to give them the very best possible outcomes we are selling our nation short in the future now that is a timeline which is not consistent with the annual electoral cycle and that's part of the difficulty why we must get cross-party support if at all possible uh, for uh, these sorts of initiatives um, and when I talk to politicians many of them have had searing experiences in their own families of inadequacies or challenges in the services yet they don't seem to be able to translate that into collective um, activity uh, when they're actually in government And we did also have a comment come in uh, from uh, one of our colleagues in Newfoundland who said she agrees with the statement that provincial child advocates are mainly focused on incident investigations and not on policy. So that's at least uh, one uh, comment from, from one of our provincial jurisdictions. Uh, Ian, if you have a question, go ahead and ask. Uh, 
Thank you. I, I was a little concerned, uh, Al, when you were talking about the sustainability of that role in the UK and how transient it appeared. Uh, what do you think of a, an all, an all party, nonpartisan approach to embracing child and youth health at a federal level? Has there been ever, ever had an attempt to make this a, an issue across all parties, regardless of who happens to be in power? Well, that's a really important point, and uh, we do have in the um, Westminster Parliament uh, uh, organizations called All Party Parliamentary Groups, and there is one for children, and uh, there are members from the House of Lords and from the House of Commons uh, who attend. But I have to say that my experience is that um, their clout when it comes to the issues affecting the elderly and the problems of our budgets, etc., their clout is fairly limited. But we also have select committees whose job it really is to put government under the grill. And with the current debacle in the UK, many of us have been arguing that the education and the health select committee should mount a joint inquiry into the state of childhood under the current uh, financial and political dimensions. And sadly, they've refused to do that. So there are very, very um, important difficulties, but if you can start corralling uh, in um, Ottawa or in your uh, provincial capitals a group of people who really care, these are politicians who care, then that is a starting point. I mean, I know Senator Landon Pearson very well. I have so much admiration for that lady and what she has tried to do in Ottawa. Uh, she needs to be cloned all over the country and for people to come together uh, with a common um, a vision, a common mission to make uh, children really important to politicians. But I tell you what drives politicians, it is the media. When I was the national director in government, I had my own press desk and every morning a digest of what was being said and the national and sometimes local newspapers about children's health was given to me. Now, media matter to politicians. And the voice of parents is vital. You may recall we had a scandal in Bristol, the uh, city of Bristol, where the outcomes for kids having uh, open heart surgery was way uh, be, uh, poorer than elsewhere in the country. Once parents understood this, they mounted a formidable campaign which forced the government to mount a national inquiry into the state of children's health services. So parents are important alongside having a, a nucleus of key politicians who are signed up. All right. Uh, Lucinda has asked if uh, this uh, session has been recorded uh, because she says there's so much information to process that she needs to watch it again. And, and it, yes, uh, Lucinda, this has been recorded. And uh, the page up on the screen uh, right now on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network is where the video will be hosted uh, in a day or two out, uh, following this. The video will be up. There's also a number of other resources on that page as you scroll down a little bit. Links to the report card uh, documents and a number of other documents, some articles written by uh, Sir Al that have been published, etc. Some very good uh, additional information supplementary to this uh, this uh, session. Um, Lisa, uh, Gwen has asked, uh, that she's saying that you gave four cogent recommendations at the end of your presentation. She's asking, is UNICEF working with other organizations across Canada to advance these? Uh, it, it's Thank you. Um, Lisa, sorry. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, Doug, would it be possible to put that slide up before us? I was I was thinking of that just a few moments ago. At least I'm just going to uh, ask you to share your screen again whenever you're ready. If you can pop that slide up just so pe people can be reminded of what those recommendations were. Sure. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, these are, you know, these are, this is UNICEF saying, um, why are we seeing what we're seeing in terms of children's well-being and asking why that is. And, you know, it's um, it's like when you're you're talking to your you know three year old child and you you say, well, it's time to leave. Well, why? Well, because we have to go to the doctor. Well, why? Well, because it's important that we you know take care of your illness. Well, why? And and so we've you know we've asked why. Why are we seeing these things in Canada? And um, you know I think we're picking up on on some of what was conveyed today that <sighs> there are political factors we think I mean some of it comes with federalism and and the devolution to provincial um, governments of much child policy but it's kind of an extreme federalism in Canada and 
you know, I think that um, Canadians demand less of their governments than many other um, populations do in industrialized countries and take more upon ourselves in terms of what we expect parents or individual, you know, service providers to do um, for children. Um, but we think some of the solution to that is some, you know, good governance structures for kids that are permanent that help um, elevate the issues. And um, so when it comes to um, uh, child rights impact assessment, that was one of our recommendations. And Sir Al referenced the fact that Sweden um, is one of a couple of countries that actually legislate that all policies and bills have to have a child lens applied to them that go through government. Um, we've worked with the Child and Youth Advocate in New Brunswick and the government of New Brunswick uh, so that New Brunswick is the first jurisdiction to require um, that all um, legislative proposals and policy proposals that are going to cabinet have a child rights impact assessment applied to them. Um, and that we see as a demonstration project. Uh, we had a symposium in May that brought together um, 150 Canadians from different organizations to learn more about child rights impact assessment. And we're having conversations with different um, organizations and different levels, uh, different other provincial governments to try to expand the practice. Um, you know, I think with state of children's reporting, um, that should be a big tent with you know, a variety of, of sectoral organizations coming together and deciding what do we need to know about kids. We've got a wealth of data, but what do we really know? And how do we use that data effectively um, for public debate and, and, and translate that into, you know, informing government and, and convincing them, persuading them to do things. So um, I think that's just, you know, an unexplored area. Um, I think UNICEF's report cards have kind of shown here's a, a good way of doing that. There's a, a couple of provinces that have put their toe in the water to do state of children reporting. Um, but, you know, I, I think we're early days and, and it is a definite collective effort required there. Um, maybe that answers the question, at least partially. Yeah, oh, for sure, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Ian, uh, you have another question for Lisa. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, great presentations today, uh, Al and Lisa. And this question is not going to surprise you, Lisa. I'm going to put my mental health hat on for a second and ask a little bit about the, the lack of, of indicators in terms of the mental health of children and youth around the world. I think it's particularly relevant given that tomorrow is World Suicide Prevention Day and after accidents, suicide accounts for the most death in Canadian youth. So any, any thoughts on, on current conversations going around about uh, identifying some key international indicators for mental wellness as well as mental illness and, and other efforts that might be going on uh, that you know of uh, around the world that we could plug into more effectively. Uh, yeah, there there is actually a huge movement around um, child indicator development and, and measurement um, with many academic institutions around the world. UNICEF's, um, you know, Inachanti Research Center that I introduced to you is part of that. Um, and we work with the OECD that collects a lot of the data uh, that we mined in for our report card and with um, with the World Health Organization and UNICEF has also piloted for low-income countries a sort of census um, mechanism where they don't have the resources to have their own national census uh, to collect child indicator data. So there's a huge amount of work um, going on and I think, you know, in terms of um, uh, mental health indicators from what I understand, there's still some challenges around um, agreeing on definitions that are internationally comparable. And you would think it wouldn't be that difficult to measure and compare, for example, you know, the, the red light suicide rates. Um, but um, I'd have to go back to, and I can, I can provide some more information on the blog that, um, that will run as part of uh, this webinar. Um, Afterwards, I, I think I need to go back to our researchers and ask why particularly we don't have good representation for mental health. My understanding is that for each dimension that we present in the report card, we really looked at some, you know, fundamental things that we're not getting right right from the start, like low birth weight and infant mortality and um, child homicide. Um, 
And, you know, I do know that a lens was that these had to be internationally comparable data to a very high standard of comparability and, um, and that they are directly policy susceptible. I don't think that should include some mental, uh, exclude some mental health indicators. So I guess the short answer is I'm going to have to find out more about where that is. And I can put that, uh, what I learned, on the, um, the blog for CAP. Well, as, Doug, as can a, I make... a member organization for the Canadian Child and Youth Health Coalition, I can, I can state that the National Infant, Child and Youth Mental Health Consortium would be very happy to assist in any way possible because we live and breathe this stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would agree. Doug, could I make a, a short comment on this? Uh, with, with a rather lateral thought train, I agree absolutely with what's being said about the need for indicators, but the flip side of the coin is to understand the lived experiences of individual children who are caught up in the services. Now, as Commissioner, listening to kids across the country, we rapidly became aware of the anger from young people who were admitted inappropriately to adult mental health wards when they were uh, suffering from serious psychiatric or emotional difficulties. And this is because of a failure to invest in adolescent facilities across the country. So we had a cause. We then got fact by working with an organization called Young Minds, and we documented the lived experiences of children in these adult mental health wards. And you can imagine they were searing and they were shocking. And we pulled that together as a report. We then targeted uh, politicians. Um, we knew there was a mental health bill being debated in Parliament. The day before the bill, we sent a copy of this to every parliamentarian. And we also arranged with the BBC uh, to uh, show um, on four consecutive nights before the parliamentary debate a 10-minute uh, special reports on the circumstance of kids with serious mental health problems. The consequence was government was forced to recognize there was a problem. They committed new money uh, with a statement that within two years, no young person would be admitted inappropriately to an adult mental health ward. So the point of this anecdote is, first of all, the effective advocacy cascade I described. The cause, the facts, the report, the targeting, the media, uh, etc. Uh, secondly, the power of collating the lived experiences of children in difficulties. And we did the same thing for kids facing deportation as failed asylum seekers. And so, yes, at the macro level, the indicators are highly relevant. At the micro level, what has actually happened to kids can be even more powerful, especially for political and public traction. All right, thank you. We've I think got a lot of opportunity to take a creative approach to, um, you know, I mean, if indicators are just a way of quantifying um, what we want to know about kids, you know, it, we can do that with what they're telling us too, right? Um, and, and the life satisfaction scale was one rudimentary attempt that we used in our report card, but. You know, how many, um, how many children are known to their neighbors? How, how many neighbors can call a child by his or her name, um, you know, a, as an indicator of mental health and community support? I mean, that, that's not something we tend to measure. Is that what kids would think are important? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think it's a, a very um, mm -hmm. difficult but not impossible area to, you know, to do more, to, to understand what we need to know about kids. That's the biggest first question. <laughs> Now, we have about uh, just over five minutes uh, until we get to the uh, scheduled hour and a half. Now, I'm willing to keep uh, the questions going as long as the panel is willing to stay here. Uh, of course, if people have to leave, by all means do. It doesn't disrupt the presentation when, when people leave. And we are recording it, as I mentioned, and it'll be on this page uh, that you see in front of you uh, uh, in a couple of days. Um, there there were a couple comments mentioned about uh, the CAFC's blog and, and some other opportunities to continue this discussion. And one of those places is on the Knowledge Exchange Network page uh, here, down at the bottom, you'll see a comment section. And if you uh, register for a free account, you're m by more than welcome to uh, to post a comment or a, a follow-up question uh, if you've had time to think about this. And uh, we're going to try and have our presenters and, and maybe even all of our panelists, uh, we'll keep uh, them aware of some of the comments that are there so that they can perhaps continue to participate in the in the conversation. But we, we do have a number of other questions that we're going to try and get through uh, uh, without uh, too much uh, without taking up too much more time. But uh, the, the next comment is from uh, Katerina, who's one of our colleagues from the Canadian Family Advisory Network. Um, she's saying the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation is planning to have a lobby day 
uh, around World Prematurity Day on November 17th, uh, and she's suggesting maybe this event would need to be made broader to include a, a health and well-being of all children in Canada. So thank you for that comment, Katerina. And if you have any information on that day, don't, please uh, feel free to send it to us at CAFC here, and we'll uh, try and uh, maybe help support the, those efforts if we can. Um, uh, Amanda from Saskatoon is asking a question uh, that, uh, you know, maybe we can continue to think about this and come back at the end. I know uh, Sir Al is going to, is going to want to come back to this uh, question, but we'll, we'll, we'll ask it now. And she's saying, what do you view as the single most important step that frontline workers and anyone else for that matter, but she's specifically asking frontline workers, what can uh, they do to help improve children's overall well-being? Al, Lisa. Oh, you want me to comment, Doug, or, or what's that? I mean, I can offer you a very quick comment, a very simple one, which is listen to children and young people. Listen to what they got to say about uh, about your services and what they think are the uh, great strengths, what they appreciate and enjoyed above, or what they don't like about your services. Um, are children, and young people, being asked sufficiently uh, for their views uh, about the issues confronting them? It's Article Twelve of the UNCRC. Anyone else have any suggestions? The frontline clinicians, what, what, should, what should their next step be? I guess a comment on my part is, is not all that different from what uh, Al just said. Uh, I guess we have to remember that it's really about service. Are our systems built to meet the needs of our service providers or are they built to meet the needs of young people and their families? Yeah. If we start turning it around and really have a, a client-centered approach to things, we realize how we have to change the ways that we do business, how our cultures have to change. Not only do we have to listen, uh, but where do we empower young people and families to help design our services, to uh, govern our, our, our services, to uh, provide a level of accountability for our services over time. That's a huge mindset because it requires a shift in power, perhaps. Uh, it looks uh, at uh, young people and families as parents in their own care as opposed to simply recipients of care. And that sounds great, I think, in theory, but it requires a great deal of change in practice. And as individual practitioners, and I am a service provider as well, it's hard to stop doing what we've always done to embrace something that we're not quite sure of. Can I just agree immediately with that? It is a massive task, and that was my job for five years as the first national clinical director in government, to try to transform uh, the culture in our services, and we produced uh, standards of care, but we also commissioned some little five-minute video clips, and one of them uh, showed little Chloe, who was 10, and she'd had uh, an encounter with a bus and had broken her arm. And we filmed her real time going into the local hospital's emergency room. And we filled it, filmed it with the camera at the waist height of the adult. So the camera saw what Chloe's eyes saw. And what did she see? She saw drunken, bloody, aggressive adults. She saw policemen. She saw notices, don't go beyond here. She went for an x-ray uh, where uh, the adults went behind the screen and nobody told her what was going on, etc., etc. And when we showed this little five-minute video clip to hard-working, motivated emergency room staff, they were horrified. Mm. They had never thought of seeing the world through the eyes of the child. So what would a video camera going into your service tomorrow, your outpatient area, your, your wards or whatever, what would the eyes of the child see about your services and how could that be used as a lever for change? And this uh, this might be going, you know, one step um, up the stream from, from the frontline service delivery, but, you know, I, I think never to rest at, um, you know, if, if you're immunizing 84% of kids, uh, that sounds like an A. You know, we all were really happy in school if we got an A plus or an A. 84% um, sounds high. Um, I think, you know, a, a rights approach challenges us to always focus on who is this, who are the 16% left out. 84%, 95% should never be enough. So we might be delivering services, but who's left out and why? We'll move on to the, uh, we, have a, we have a comment uh, that's uh, going to end with a question from Diane here. And she, she goes on to say, 
While I agree there needs to be a federal initiative for children's well-being, it seems that there is a lack of public will or understanding about the rights as well as the social, economic, and educational needs for children in Canada. It seems that this is in part a relationship between the parents' responsibility for their own children rather than children are a valuable resource for all Canadians. So our question is, what are the recommendations that we can use to influence the public's opinion? We've talked a lot about uh, influencing our politicians, but what can we use, what arguments should we be using to influence the public opinion in this regard? Well, I give you as a quick answer my experience of being the director of research for Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. This is one of the um, uh, best children's hospitals in the world. I won't compare it against Toronto Sick Kids or Vancouver, but it's an, an outstanding hospital. And we know from research that it has 95% market penetration. That means 95% of British people know that uh, GOS is a children's hospital in, in London and knows something about what it does. Now, that doesn't happen by chance. I have seen at first hand the staggering importance of the press office and the comms strategy for that hospital. I know that sick kids in Toronto will probably have the same sort of office. The continuing drip feed of stories about children into the media, uh, the responsible and sometimes the irresponsible media, a concerted press campaign is really very important. And I agree with you that in this country, in England, very similar to Canada, the public is in many ways antipathetic to the cause of children with great nervousness of the interference of the state over the rights of parents. But I think we can raise the importance of parents by this continuous drip feed of stories. Our research shows us that the majority of media stories about kids in the UK are negative, especially towards teenagers, and we have to change that. Mm -hmm. All right, Lisa, uh, one question for you came in. Um, Crystal's asking, are youth included in the reports? And, in the, and I'm not sure if she means in the data. I'm assuming she means in the creation of the reports. And is there a, de a definition of youth uh, that's used internationally? Um, so the... Um we're looking at uh, children under 18, which is um, how the Convention on the Rights of the Child defines children and their rights to certain things um, <clears throat> that governments have agreed to provide for their well-being. And those things are all, you know, covered by the indicators that we've selected here. Uh, and different um, indicators um, have, uh, you know, measure the conditions of children at different ages. And um, so some of the surveys around risk behaviors focus on kids at age um, 11, 13, and 15. Um, infant mortality obviously covers, you know, children um, below the age of one. Um, so there's sort of a, you know, a sprinkling of different age groups, but the cutoff is 18. Um, and that's how internationally, at least at the UN, we define a child, um, whereas youth are defined as um, a much broader band of up to age 24. So I know Canada, you know, has, has a, a certain understanding of what we mean by children and youth. Um, but for this report, we mean under 18. I hope, I hope that's clear. And the last question that we have, uh, we're just uh, just a couple minutes over our scheduled time, so there's one more question here. So I think we'll wrap up the questions from the audience and, and with this one and uh, following this question, maybe we'll have some closing, uh, any closing comments from our panel. But the, the last question that we have here is, Sir Al noted that the voice of parents is critical in affecting change. In an era where there seems to be competition between generations our, regarding resource allocation, growing aging population, etc., is there experience in the UK of engaging grandparents in advocating for children's issues? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I, I agree absolutely with the intergenerational divide, which is uh, an important uh, social issue. I think I'm right in saying that in California, uh, it was grandparental power that led the administration at that time to apply a tax uh, on cigarette sales for the benefit of, of poor uh, children. I may be wrong about that, but grandparents are really extremely important people. I'm one myself, and I move in a circle with uh, really quite relevant movers and shakers and business and industry and politics. And so I think harnessing the interests of grandparents uh, to be um, effective advocates alongside parents is potentially a goldmine to uh, dig into. 
And Gwen, I hope you're considering going to the CAFC conference on, in Toronto on October 20th to 23rd. We do have a session that we'll be talking about children's health care amidst the uh, what's called what we referred to as the intensifying tsunami of the aging population. So uh, we'll be able to get uh, deep into those issues at that time. Uh, so that wraps up the questions from the audience. Uh, we'll just leave it open to the panel. If there's any uh, closing comments, maybe we'll start with uh, with um, Ian or uh, or Lisa. If you have any comments, I, I I think it's just clear that we have our work cut out for us. Uh, but we are also quite fortunate that we do have some uh, uh, networks of individuals that are very passionate about these ideas. Uh, we have some champions across the country, and I think that if we were able to uh, mobilize some of our efforts, focus some of our activities, we could actually move some mountains. All right. Lisa, do you have any final words? Um, yeah, I just think really for me, you know, I have a lot of learning to do uh, still, but I've come to a point where I, I really believe that, um, you know, Canadians are, are, are getting... Um, the, the services and governments that they um, that they ask for, and I think we have to ask for more and really see children. And it's a bit of a cliche, but you know, children as being raised in a village. Um, I have, you know, I have looked deeply and broadly at what is happening with children in other industrialized countries, which is sort of a natural comparator for Canada, um, as much as UNICEF works in you know Africa and, and every other part of the world. Um, but I think really the common denominator among the, the, the countries at the top that are doing well for children is that they um, expect a lot from their society in terms of how they invest in children and make them visible as a priority. And I, I just think we have to do it. We'd be challenged by Al to do more to effectively communicate and generate debates and, and make children visible um, in our public debates. And that will eventually, I think, tip, you know, tip the political weight as well. All right, thanks. And we'll maybe have some a final comment from Sir Al. I know that uh, during the, just the preparation of this session, you talked a lot about to wanting this session to be a call to action and for people to walk away from this with, you know, thinking about what, what it is that they're going to do to make a difference. So maybe you can, you know, close us off with, uh, with, with a final comment. Well, thank you, Doug and Elaine and, and uh, the panel. Uh, it's been great to take part in this and to listen to the very thoughtful comments uh, that are coming back in. I uh, loop back to my starting slides. I think you guys have got the most incredible set of opportunities. And if you can't do it in Canada, then what hope is there for us? Um, who don't have your privileges and your wealth. Uh, you really have the most fantastic, if not mouth-watering, opportunities uh, to uh, put kids at the heart of your priorities. So mobilizing opinion, brigading important organizations, the coalition, I think, is extremely important. I'd love to have you in the UK doing the work you're doing. Uh, but above all, getting the attention of the politicians. That is the big one. And that is the big challenge. So my final comment is to the audience, what do you guys think? Has this been useful or a complete waste of time? Uh, and what are you going to do, as Doug said? Uh, because I sit in so many events where we navel gaze for hours. What are the actions that will follow from this webinar? I'd love to hear from you as to what you're going to do. All right, and again, I'll just point direct people to the Knowledge Exchange Network and that comment section. Uh, if you have any suggestions or comments or want to share a story about what it is that you're going to do, feel free to uh, enter those comments there. And I'd just like to take the opportunity to, 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 say, to say thanks to the Canadian Child and Youth Health Coalition for joining us on this session. And I'm going to hand it over to uh, Elaine Orbine and Sarah Jones uh, to uh, let us wrap this, uh, wrap, close this session off completely. Fantastic. Thanks, Doug. And I just want to take half a second to thank Lisa and to thank Al for your tremendous passion, commitment, and presentations today. Um, and uh, Sarah, I'm, I'm really going to turn to you as our coalition co-chair. And I think that Lisa's slide, Put Children First, uh, is maybe something as a member of the coalition we can take forward as our commitment and advocacy agenda, uh, if you will, and, and perhaps begin to accept um, Al's challenge around um, uh, what can we do and, and really um, not navel gaze, that, that's, uh, that, that's not an option. 
So Sarah, over to you, please, to, um, to close this wonderful uh, webinar. Very briefly, thank you everybody for attending the webinar. The coalition will not leave you hanging. Um, I think I can assure you of that. Uh, a couple of quotes. We have the can-do spirit. Um, we will be the most desirable land to raise our children in. Um, and I think uh, it is very hard as a frontline individual to know um, exactly where to go next. Um, and I hope that in the near future, the coalition will be able to help you uh, with that, both sort of in on the front line, as Ian has uh, uh, pointed out, we're thinking about um, uh, you know the patient and, and their family as being so involved in their care, but also uh, at a different level too, um, uh, perhaps uh, in, in closer to, to some of Lisa's comments uh, um, in in where where we are in in the. Um, in children's uh, uh, care as a, as a whole, and, and I think one of the, the things that hit me today was uh, um, the comments around life satisfaction scale and, and how children perceive themselves and uh, the community supports we need. We do need a village to raise our children, um, and hopefully the coalition will be able to move forward with that uh, in the future. So thank you all once again for attending. Thank you very much to our, our speakers and uh, also to our panelists. All right, thank you, Sarah. And uh, that wraps up this session. We, as, as I mentioned at the top, we usually do these sessions on Wednesdays at 11 Eastern time. Uh, you can always go to the CAFC.org website uh, under the CAFC Presents section to find out uh, information about upcoming webinars. So hopefully we will continue to see you on our next uh, webinars. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, don't, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. Thanks again to all of our panelists and speakers and, uh, and to our audience. So goodbye, everyone. <laughs>